Lazarus. Lazarus, Lazarus. It's quite a famous story. And uh, I, I, you know, it's very common about, you know, I don't know anybody else named Lazarus. It's just one of those names kind of stuck in history. I don't know if there's a, if there are people in the world named Lazarus. Anybody else meet a Lazarus before? What would you call them? Lazy? What's the nickname for Lazarus? I don't know. But it's a, it's a great story. It's uh, many of us, it's ingrained in our memories of uh, one of the great stories of resuscitation in the Bible. There are there are other stories of bodily resuscitation, and I just always like to remember the difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Resurrection is a spiritual thing. It's what happens when you know God's life comes back into our lives, the light of Christ. Resuscitation is when a body gets back up again. It's good, it's good to remember the difference between those two things, because resuscitation happened a few times um, in the Bible. I'm not going to list them. You can go searching for them. Uh, call to help you. She reads the Bible every day. So, Cory, yeah. I love this story. It's uh, got lots of detail, and it. it starts right off with uh, Mary, and it says Mary, she's the one who wiped his feet. It did hadn't happened yet in the Gospel of John, huh? It's something that's mentioned that had happened in the past. Mary and Martha's house. Mary was the one who anointed his feet with oil. It doesn't come up until a few chapters later. Well, chapter 12, I think, the next chapter. Isn't that interesting? So it's obviously a story that had gone around, and the writer of John, in like 110 AD, knew that that was a story about Mary, and wanted to remind, remind the people reading or listening, it's that Mary, but hadn't told the story himself yet, until 12. I get a kick out of that kind of stuff. But it starts starts with, really, a crisis moment with Jesus saying, we have to go back to Judea. And the disciples saying, we just came from Judea and they're angry at you. You know, the whole tearing of the temple comment, all that kind of stuff. And the Judeans are looking to stone you. Now, you notice on the screen, how many of you notice this? It says Jews all through the scripture five times. But my good friend Norma always says Judeans. How many of you notice that? Good, you're paying attention. Much more than I expected, actually. Here's the thing. The Gospel of John has been used for centuries and centuries and centuries for Christians to disdain and hate Jews. Because all through the Gospel of John, it was translated in English, the Jews did this to Jesus, and the Jews didn't like Jesus, and the Jews ganged up on Jesus. It wasn't the Jews. It's The natural Greek was the Judeans, and that's the leadership of the Jews. The Sanhedrin, in fact. The, the, the high court of the Jewish people. And so... It doesn't make sense when you're telling a story about a bunch of Jewish people like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Jesus, and the disciples, who are all Jews, to say, and the Jews came with her. That doesn't make sense, because that's everybody. Right? So it's a very specific group of the Jews, and good old Norma knows that. She translated it all for us appropriately to Judeans. So, they say, right, the Judeans are trying to stone you, or hurl you off a cliff, or some of the other Judean tricks. Why would we go back there? Thomas, Thomas the the twin. We also call him Thomas the doubter, doubting poor Thomas. Thomas the twin. We never know who his twin is. Although in this scripture lesson, it's Martha. They're twins of faith. In this scripture lesson, they both have faith in Jesus. And Thomas says, "I'll go with them." Thomas the courageous. Thomas the lion-hearted. Thomas says, I don't care what you guys say. I'm going with them, even if it means we're going to die. That's powerful faith. So off they go. Well, he waits a few days. Right? We always wonder, why did Jesus wait two days? Well, it's to prove something. Waits two days, and off they go. From Thomas's gregarious statement of faith, I will go with him. We are met with Martha's natural upset. Lord, if you only had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary says it later as well. It's the only thing that's said twice in that scripture lesson. Martha says, Lord, if you only had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's overcome. Mary, when he sees, she sees Jesus, says, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's kind of a rebuke and an upset, but it's also natural. You understand that. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking. They had sent for Jesus and he hadn't come on time. He didn't get there on time. Why not, Jesus, they're saying. My heart's breaking here because my brother is dead. Even in her rebuke, though, there is faith. If you had been here, I know it would have been different. It's a great statement of faith. 
So we go from Thomas, I'll go with him. I have faith to Martha. If you had been here, I know you would have changed things. And then she says this, But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Even now, but even now I know. She stands up with beautiful faith in her grief and says, I still believe that something wonderful can happen. Jesus doesn't promise physical life out of physical death or doesn't fit, promise physical life without physical death. She, he goes on and says, I am the resurrection of life, those who believe in me, right? He's not talking about physical body stuff. Jesus is talking about the experience of God's abundant life that swallows up the sting of death. But as a sign, he gets busy. This is one of the great seven signs in the Gospel of John. Then Mary arrives and she's overcome and Jesus becomes overwhelmed with her. I love that Jesus had close friends. These are the only ones mentioned. I mean, his disciples were buddies, right? But here are these other people who are the only people I know in all the Gospels listed as friends. And in fact, people who Jesus loved. It says accordingly because he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Right? I love this image of the real guy, Jesus, with real friends. Who placed a place in Bethany he'd hang out, you know, and have a sip of coffee or a glass of wine, tell stories. He loved Lazarus, and Mary, and Martha. And so Mary comes and he can't help it anymore. And he falls apart. And he weeps. We always think of Jesus as kind of a little aloof, you know, a little um, a little standoffishy from the human experience. Here he is, splank nisomai, I imagine. His heart was wrenched for him. And he cries. We often cry with the sisters. If only you had been here, God. But Martha encourages us to believe that God is the one who moves into our world with all of its darkness, all of its brokenness, all of its grief. Our God is the God of life who always finds a way into the darkness. And Jesus calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus! I was mad at Lazarus. What? What? Lazarus! Me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Come out! Leah, Lazarus, it's these two famous phrases. Lazarus, come out! Now he gets stinky and gross smelling and all bandaged up. He can't even see and he stumbles out. Got some good images up here. Look at that. Oh, that's a good one. Look how happy they are. And look how stunned Lazarus is. Lazarus is like, what? And the family's like, hey, we're so happy to see you. Right? Even the kids are there. Look at this little kid. So excited. Gee, Lazarus, come out. And then he says to the community, unbind him and let him go. There's the, there's the whole turn of the whole scripture lesson. Unbind him and let him go. He is free. He is liberated. He is alive again. God's love comes into our despair. God's love comes into our death places, into our tombs and wins. In the midst of despair, the Lord of life, the God of love, reigns supreme. Of course, the point of the story is, Lazarus is us. We are the entombed ones. Lazarus is Saskatchewan. This week, very apparent. That Saskatchewan is entombed. Entombed by racism. Who wants to tune out right now? It's the problem with the word racism. You hear it and you want to turn it off. Because who wants to be, it's, you know, who's a racist? Not me, right? Like who wants to be called a racist? It's a tough word. It's a hard word and it's a word that's been used in anger for generations. I'd like you to hear it differently. I'd like you to just hear it as a word of truth that we can face. We can do this. We can face this because we are entombed by racism in this province. And it's been like that for a very, very, very long time. And it's killing us. Well, it's killing some of us. I'm not going to go on and on about 
trials and verdicts and all that kind of stuff. I think we need to pray for everybody on all sides, of course. We need to deeply pray for our province, deeply pray for our, our city. My leadership circle in Whitby Island, I was there last weekend and I brought the verdict and the court case to them and the heartbreak. And they, that night, the people in that circle, wise leaders from across America, held us in prayer. And next morning, we're anxious to hear what happened. Was there violence? Was there upset? What happened? People all over the world are paying attention. And they're holding us accountable, <coughs> trying, and they're holding us in prayer. We need to pay attention. Because, as I said, a year ago, August, to you all, if I drove on to a farm in this province, I would never, ever be shot. If I got four of my buddies, Warren and I, and a bunch of our buddies got together, and we were ripped up, snorting drunk, and we drove in a truck up to no good on a farm in Saskatchewan, we would not be shot dead. I'm not making it up. It's a fact. My girls can walk the streets of Saskatoon safely without worry of a police car pulling up and ask them what they're doing. They can even wear their hoodies up if they want. They can go shopping in a mall and not be followed by security, as Janet Sigurdsson reminded us recently. And just in case you think it's far away from us, this, these issues of indigenous and non-indigenous people and what are we going to do, how are we going to get rid of colonialism and is, could it ever go away? In case you think it's far away from us, it is right here at Mayfair Church. Right here in our own family. I have an indigenous sister. We have indigenous moms and dads who sit right here in our midst. Sunday after Sunday, we've got indigenous children as part of our loving family at Mayfair. This is about us. This is about our family at Mayfair. We cannot put it away and pretend it's not happening to us. And we cannot pretend that which way a verdict went in a court case has is what we should be paying attention to. We can pay attention to it, but it's what it brings light to. It's what the big finger of this court case points to. And that's the racism that still exists so awful in our province. I know friends have been pulled over because the car they were driving in the wrong neighborhood. Pulled over because they're an indigenous person driving a car. Like my car. Well, it just seems odd, so we'll pull you over. What are you doing? Where are you going? I'd never get pulled over for that reason. I actually speed up when I go by police and I never get pulled over. I'm just joking. Those of us who are Caucasian have to remember, and I said this into the circle the other day at Whitby, that the world is tipped in our favor. We were talking about resiliency at Whitby Island, and I said, I have trouble talking about resiliency because the world is tipped in my favor. I hardly ever have to think about being resilient. I hardly ever have to think about being resilient. Nothing bad happens to me socially. It is right here with us, folks. And as a community of faith, the story of Lazarus calls us to live in the darkness, understand the tomb we're in, and figure out a better way. Because God is the God of life. God is the God of life. And this week, I need you to hear that. I have heard words this week of determination and hope. I have heard calls for immediate action. I've heard calls for peaceful action from Colton Bushy's family. Peaceful action. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people continue this day to eat, to talk, to learn, to work, to weep, and to laugh together. Many continue to dig deep to recommit to a new relationship. Talking seems cheap these days. But sitting together never is. And walking together never is. And showing up and listening is never cheap. Because God's love cannot be stopped. Lazarus got up and walked out of his tomb. He was unbound and set free. Question this Lent is will we join him?